Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Karen Nichols. Today's presentation is offered to real estate owners and advisors to help them understand several techniques for real estate investors to defer or reduce their income taxes. During the webinar, you may ask questions using the GoToWebinar controls located in the upper right corner of your screen. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. The information contained within this presentation is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for obtaining accounting, tax, or financial advice from a professional tax planner or financial planner. Presentation of the information is not intended to create and receipt does not constitute a tax planner client or financial planner client relationship. Viewers and readers are advised not to act upon this information without seeking the service of a professional tax and or financial planner. Bedford Cost Segregation is one of the largest providers of cost segregation services in the industry. Established in 2002, Bedford provides tax reduction services to real estate owners nationwide through its staff of over 60 tax, engineering, and support professionals. Bedford has delivered over 10,000 cost segregation studies to date. We are a founding member of the American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals, and we provide an audit defense warranty. I would now like to introduce today's presenter. Jeff Glass is Bedford's business development manager for the West Coast region, where he works with CPA firms, developers, and real estate owners to assist them in obtaining the tax advantages afforded by cost segregation. He has special expertise in applying the IRS repair and capitalization regulations and often speaks to groups on this topic. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. Okay, thanks a lot, Karen. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today. I would like to begin by observing that most real estate owners are probably paying more income tax than they're required to pay and possibly by quite a lot. The reason is they and their tax advisors are probably unaware of their opportunities for reducing their income taxes that are now permitted by the IRS. So during the next half hour, I want to help you get a basic understanding of these opportunities so you can take advantage of them for yourself. First, what I'd like to do is review cost segregation. We'll take a look at how you can defer income taxes by accelerating depreciation deductions. And I realize this may be a review for some of you, but I'm hoping you'll find some new facets of cost segregation as I go through that portion. And then I'm going to show you how to write off assets that no longer need to be depreciated under the tangible property regulations. I'd like to tell you a little story about how this uh, came to mind for me. I was first involved with this a couple of years ago when the regulations were still new. And I encountered the owner of this warehouse property that had been owned for over 20 years. So at that time, it was already pretty depreciated. And I was asked to look at the potential benefit for increased cash flow from cost segregation. And when I did that, the result was fairly modest. But it turned out that the owner planned to spend over $100,000 on a new roof for the building in the next year. And when I learned that, it dawned on me that if the roof job met certain criteria under the new regulations, it would be possible to take the cost as an expense rather than depreciating it over 39 years. Now, in order to justify that decision, the roof uh, for that roof, the client would need to have certain data that a cost segregation study could provide. So the client went ahead and had us do the study, and they were then able to take some accelerated depreciation deductions and deduct the entire cost of the new roof. The, the new roof that they put on uh, last year. Now, I share that because it provides a glimpse as to how cost segregation and the tangible property regulations can be combined to help reduce income taxes and improve after-tax cash flow. So let's review cost segregation, what it is and how it works. Now, as many of you attending today are probably aware, cost segregation is the IRS accepted method of taking accelerated depreciation on commercial real estate or multifamily real estate. It's a strategy for reducing income taxes in the early years of ownership, and it's using an engineering-based method to determine what is in the real estate that qualifies. Now, one way to know that cost segregation is an accepted practice is to know that the IRS has actually written a guide for their auditors on this subject and it instructs the auditors what to look for 
in cost segregation studies during audits to make sure that they're done correctly. Now that isn't to say that cost segregation is an audit flag because it is not. In fact, many studies are done on a retrospective basis and when that's done, the taxpayer doesn't even need to file an amended return for prior years. Instead, they would simply file this form, Form 3115, which is processed by the IRS on an automatic consent basis instead of requiring any kind of manual review. Now that doesn't guarantee you won't be audited, but it does mean, I mean, most of the cost segregation studies are done are accepted routinely by the IRS. Who is a good candidate for applying cost segregation? Well, if you own commercial real estate and you can use additional deductions, that's a good start. And you should have an estimate done just to see what the outcome would be under reasonable assumptions. Generally, cost segregation produces great results if you've owned your property for no more than about 15 years and if the initial cost basis of your property, excluding the land piece, is at least a million dollars. A cost segregation can be applied with good results in the year of sale for properties that haven't been owned for more than about 15 years, and that would be done to offset any taxable gain upon sale. Cost segregation came about as a result of a tax court case. Back in 1997, Hospital Corporation of America successfully argued in tax court that hospital buildings and commercial buildings generally contain a combination of long-term real property and shorter-term assets. The short-term assets include things such as land improvements surrounding the buildings and lots of different types of tangible personal property such as very types of flooring, uh, wall coverings, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems that are there to support specific functions undertaken by the building occupant. And the case that Hospital Corporation of America made was made using an engineering-based study to support their claims. And the outcome of that ca case gave rise to the cost segregation industry. So these days, when a real estate owner first builds or acquires their property, then normally what happens is their accountant will set up the asset, at least the non-land portion of the asset, on the depreciation schedule as a single line item with a 39-year depreciation period, or 27 and a half if it happens to be a residential property. Now, when this is done, it can mean that the property owner will be overpaying their income taxes in the early years of ownership because whatever short-term assets may exist in their building are going to be depreciated over an excessively long time period and the owner will miss out on their near-term depreciation deductions. If instead the property owner has a cost segregation study performed, then the cost of the non-land asset can be broken down into the long-term component and shorter-term components, namely 15-year land improvements and five-year personal property. When that's done, then the depreciation can be significantly accelerated and that reduces income taxes during the early years of ownership. Now, the magnitude of the cash flow benefit in net present value terms is usually somewhere between 4% and 8% of the initial cost of the improvements. The mix of the different types of assets that you'll find in any particular building can vary quite a bit. They depend upon the property type and, of course, what the individual properties actually contain within them. But we can make some generalizations, and based upon our experience, as seen in this chart, you have a garden style apartment as an example, typically that's going to have somewhere between 20% and 40% of its cost that can be reallocated from long term real property into shorter term land improvements and you would also um, have quite a different outcome if you were looking at say an auto dealership where you might have between 30 and 60% of its cost in short term assets. To get a better idea of what some of these short-term assets actually are, let's take a look inside the familiar environment of a grocery store. And that's just an example. The IRS permits many of the interior improvements that we see in this picture to be classified as personal property. Now you see the fluorescent lighting there on the ceiling? That's considered the main lighting, and that has to be depreciated over 39 years. But there's also track lighting here, and that's considered personal property with a five-year depreciation life because it's special use. It serves the function of illuminating the produce display. There are lots of other things in this picture that are eligible for five-year depreciation because they support the specialized function of grocery retailing. Now, individually, these assets may seem minor in terms of their costs, but they really do add up. If we go outside the building, then we'll see various types of land improvements, and those are anything that's generally outside that is not the raw land. 
as we can see in this picture, we've got things such as asphalt paving, the concrete curbs, landscaping, irrigation, fences, walls, gates. All these things are considered 15-year assets by the IRS. One exception is site lighting. You know, those big lights on top of the tall metal poles. Those are generally con uh, considered to be a five-year asset by the IRS. So when a cost segregation study is done, each and every component comprising the building and the surrounding land improvements are itemized, and they're all assigned an individual cost and the correct IRS accepted depreciation line. All these costs are summed up and reconciled with the total cost of construction or acquisition, including any additional capital expenditures that have been incurred during the period of ownership. This level of detail that you see here is what the IRS expects in the event of an audit. This chart illustrates how cost segregation shifts a significant amount of depreciation expense to the early years of ownership. Suppose we're looking at a 39-year time period. The red line represents the straight line depreciation for the entire set of assets of a property over 39 years. The blue line shows how writing off some of the costs faster results in a great deal more depreciation in the early years, generally years six through or seven and that reduces taxable income in those years. The green line illustrates the increase in after-tax cash flow that results from taking more depreciation deductions in the early years due to cost segregation. And we all know that when somebody wins the lottery, the lottery winner usually prefers to take a discounted lump sum up front rather than a small stream of payments over many years. And it's similar with cost segregation. Real estate owners are usually better off taking their depreciation deductions up front if they can due to the time value of money. There is a popular misconception about cost segregation, and that is that it must be done in the year property is built or acquired. But in reality, many property owners apply cost segregation on a retrospective basis, and that's usually because they haven't heard about it until they've owned their property for some years. Now, just to illustrate this, suppose we have an office building with a depreciable cost basis of $10 million with 15% of that cost in five-year personal property and 10% in 15-year land improvements. And let's assume that that was the result of a cost segregation study. The cost segregation would deliver an after-tax cash flow benefit of $622,830, assuming a 40% tax rate. So let's compare the cash flow pattern of cost segregation applied at two different points in time. If the study were done up front at the time of acquisition, the tax benefit would be spread out over six years. But if instead the owner applied cost segregation in the beginning of the sixth year instead of at the beginning of the ownership period, the owner would get the same cash flow benefit, but it would simply be delayed. So the benefit is still significant, which is why we see so many look-back studies, as we call them. As I said earlier, the magnitude of tax benefit obtainable by applying cost segregation is usually in the range of 4% to 8% of the depreciable assets. So for a $10 million building, we're talking about $400,000 to $800,000 in tax reduction and possibly more depending upon what's in and around the building. Cost segregation can be done cost effectively for small properties as long as they have a cost basis of at least a million or more. Here's a picture of a small freestanding building that uh, we did a cost seg study on. And you can also apply it to small parts of big properties, such as a luxury condominium for rent. And of course, it works well for very large properties. In addition to complete buildings, cost segregation can be applied to tenant improvements. And that's usually done when there's at least a couple hundred thousand dollars worth. And the reason that works is because there's usually quite a bit of uh, five-year personal property that is found within tenant improvements. Now, besides new construction and new acquisitions, what other situations should be considered for cost segregation? Probably the most common one is a property acquired by a 1031 exchange in which the acquisition price is at least a million more than the exchange basis from whatever property was relinquished. It's the amount paid over the value of the relinquished property that can be cost segregated. Anytime you have a big renovation or expansion to a building, that would be a good candidate for cost segregation as well as tenant improvement jobs as I mentioned a moment ago. When you have a step up in cost basis of a million or more, that is usually, of course, due to a buyout or maybe the death of a partner, then the stepped-up basis should be considered for cost segregation. 
And lastly, when a property that's never been cost segregated is sold, and if it's been held for no more than 10 to 15 years, it's possible to offset some of the gain on sale by performing a retrospective cost segregation study. In this case, there's a tax arbitrage possibility in which the taxes saved by depreciation deductions do not have to be entirely given back through recapture. Now, the details on that are really beyond the scope of this short presentation, but contact me if you want to know more about that. Now, as promised, I'm going to share with you some new ways to use cost segregation studies to reduce income taxes. These opportunities exist if you hold real estate for long-term investment, and if you're depreciating the costs for past repairs, maintenance, and improvements, if you're planning some significant expenditures on your property in the future, and if your current or future renovations will cause some of the components of your building to be taken out, thrown away, retired before the end of their tax lives. Cost segregation studies can help in these situations and they can provide new options to expense many of the costs that in past years needed to be capitalized and depreciated over long time periods. The reason that this is so is because we have some relatively new IRS tax regulations that change the definitions of what costs must be capitalized or depreciated over time versus what may be expensed. The new rules are usually called the tangible property regulations and sometimes they're called the IRS repair and capitalization regulations. These came into effect in tax year 2014 and they, frankly, they represent the biggest change in tax accounting for real estate in many, many years. These rules are pretty long and they're complicated and of course they're worded in such a way that, well, they're favorable to the IRS because they're, they're vague in some cases. It's been my observation that a lot of property owners and their tax advisors have ignored these regulations even though they may offer some pretty taxpayer friendly benefits and even though failure to comply with them could have some unpleasant consequences. All right, so let's take a closer look at what these regulations are all about. And first, let's uh, nickname them to make it easier to say them. Let's call them the TPRs. And these new definitions for you know, what costs related to tangible property uh, must be capitalized and what must be expense is what I'm going to go through next. Costs that must be capitalized start with what are known as facilitative costs, which are generally soft costs that can't be allocated to any specific improvements, and they usually occur prior to placing the asset into service. And for that matter, any cost incurred prior to going into service must be capitalized. Next, we have a new definition of capital costs that I call BARS, which is an acronym for Betterments, Adaptations, and Restorations. Let's take a look at these. Betterments, in brief, are costs incurred to fix material defects, or they add to the size of the building, or they increase the capacity of one of its systems, such as a larger HVAC system. Betterments always need to be capitalized either over 27 and a half or 39 years, depending upon residential or commercial. Then we have adaptations. These occur when money is spent to convert a property from one use to an entirely different use, such as a warehouse building to an apartment or manufacturing to a restaurant. Always have to capitalize restoration costs. And then finally we have, uh, I'm sorry, I meant uh, adaptations. And moving along, we have uh, restorations, which must be capitalized. These are for replacing major structural components or any kind of substantial structural part, such as a steel beam, as seen in this picture. Now, there's going to be some room for interpretation here, but generally speaking, these must be distinguished from routine repairs and maintenance, and the cost of restorations must be capitalized. So that's a very brief treatment of what must be capitalized. Here comes a very brief treatment of what may be expensed, and here's where the taxpayer-friendly features I mentioned are found. First, we have several safe harbors that provide some simple expense deduction options. The first one here is the de minimis safe harbor, and that allows writing off any cost up to $2,500 per invoice or per item, and it's a $5,000 limit if you happen to have reviewed or audited financials. Next, there is the small taxpayer safe harbor. If you meet the definition of small taxpayer, you can deduct the lesser of $10,000 per year or 2% of your original building cost basis, which must be no more than a million dollars. Not very helpful for most taxpayers, but the next ones are really helpful. There's a routine maintenance safe harbor, uh, and then specially defined deductions for things we'll call non-bar, non-material costs, and partial asset dispositions. 
These are all new, and let's go over these one by one. The routine maintenance safe harbor of the TPRs is very useful because many common costs that you used to ha have to capitalize now can be expensed. The idea here is that if a cost is incurred to help keep the property in what the IRS calls its ordinarily efficient operating condition, and the cost is expected to be repeated at least once every 10 years, then it can be expensed, even if it's a large dollar amount and even if your accountant used to capitalize that sort of thing in the past. I've seen property owners deduct hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars applying this particular safe harbor rule, not only to their current year costs, but also retrospectively, which is made possible in the regulations. And next, we have another rule that can be very helpful. This rule would be invoked after considering all the previous ones. In other words, if you could expense an item using any of the previously mentioned rules, you're done take the write-off, but if not, then see if this rule will allow you to take an expense. In this case, if the cost does not meet the definition of a betterment, adaptation, or restoration, and if it is not material in magnitude, then it may be expensed. Now, the definition of material in the regulations can be vague, even though there are many examples. The examples generally indicate about a 30% materiality threshold. So, for example, when 30 out of 100 windows of the same type are replaced with uh, new windows that are the same type as the old, that's not considered material, so the cost can be expensed. Now, inevitably, there are going to be some situations in which counting up items like this won't work, such as when a new roof is put on. And in this case, we can look at the cost of the new roof, and we can compare it to the cost of the building system of which the new roof is a part. And that brings up the tool that the IRS has created for that purpose. They call it units of property and their associated building systems. Now, the building itself in this scheme is the unit of property, and the roof is part of the building structure, which is one of nine building systems to be considered when evaluating materiality. So here's a chart that helps to explain this. In the chart, we see on the left side the way a depreciation schedule might show the historical cost breakdown from an accounting point of view for a building, and in comparison, we have the new IRS unit of property breakdown on the right. The total cost of the building is the same, both on the left and the right, <clears throat> but it's broken down in different ways. The IRS breakdown on the right shows their nine building system categories that can be used as the denominator in a fraction, with the cost of, say, a new roof or some other component being the numerators. And while the IRS does not say this explicitly in the regulation, it's Bedford's view that a property owner that uses this type of breakdown and limits expensing to items that don't exceed 30% of their building system will most likely not be challenged on that point if they're audited, simply because of the strong preference shown in the examples by the IRS for a 30% materiality threshold. Now, cost segregation studies can supply the unit of property breakdown used to make these materiality determinations to provide support in the event of an audit. So, for example, if uh, $400,000 is spent on a new roof and that's not considered a betterment, and you know from your cost segregation study that the cost is less than 30% of the building's structure, then you should be safe in taking the roof as a current year expense. Now, that's new, and it's a very valuable concept that real estate owners and investors should take hold of. Let's look at an example of applying the cost segregation study methodology to making expensing decisions under the TPRs. Let's take the case of an 80-unit apartment building that we looked at, where we analyzed the owner's depreciation schedule and their supporting documentation to determine which of the many post-acquisition assets would qualify for expensing treatment either under the routine maintenance safe harbor or as a non-bar, non-material capital cost. What we found was, well, quite a few qualifying expenses, and I've highlighted a couple of them here in the table. We have roof work back in 2008 and 2010, and together the costs for the roof work added up to 95000 And in total, we found over 900000 in assets that could be retroactively expensed under these new regulations. The final taxpayer-friendly feature of the TPRs is the ability to expense the remaining tax basis of assets that have been physically removed from a building. Now, that eliminates a problem, the problem of so-called ghost assets, such as when a new roof is added. 
if a new roof is of a type that's considered betterment and it has to be capitalized under the regulations, then it used to be that the embedded cost of the old roof stayed on the depreciation schedule, creating essentially a ghost asset. So now with the TPRs, there is an IRS accepted method permitting the write-off, which essentially enables cash for trash. The challenge to using this opportunity is coming up with defensible numbers for the cost basis of the assets that were never broken out separately, such as the cost of the old roof. That is where a cost segregation study can help because it can provide the separate cost for all the components of a building in a manner that the IRS has long accepted. Let me give you an example of some partial asset dispositions from a high-rise office building that we worked on. The items that I'm showing you here in this table represent the old items that were displaced by new ones. The cost segregation study was used to determine what their individual costs were, and then the owner's accountant was able to take those figures and compute the accumulated depreciation from the time each asset was placed in the service, and then write off the remaining cost basis of each retired asset. In some cases, cost segregation might be more than is needed to derive the cost. The IRS and the regulations provides for the use of the producer price index as a tool for discounting the current replacement cost of assets back to the date place and service. Now here at Bedford, we've used this method in some cases as a shortcut and it can be effective. However, it does have its limits. Sometimes it can produce some illogical results and so you would need to use that with caution. Just to reiterate, some of these taxpayer-friendly features of the TPRs can be applied retroactively. So the routine maintenance safe harbor and the expensing of non-bar, non-material capital costs can be applied to prior years without any limit. And all you need to do is file one form with the IRS. That's why it would be wise to review depreciation schedules to see if there may be any capital expenditures booked as assets in the past that might be good candidates for retroactive expensing. The first of the two safe harbors I mentioned are annual elections on the tax return. So those can only be used on a going forward basis. And the asset disposition option also can only be used in the year a disposition occurs. So it's a good idea to review each year whether any dispositions have actually occurred in order to avoid missing the opportunity to write them down. So the cost segregation method can be valuable to using the TPRs because it brings to the whole equation this combination of expertise and a, a rigorous methodology that the IRS respects. And that gives you a solid defense in the event of an audit. I've learned from dealing with a lot of accounting firms over the last couple of years that unless we're talking about the really large ones, most firms have been hard pressed to master these regulations. And they, of course, they're accounting firms, so they generally lack construction engineering skills needed to apply the regulations in a sound manner. So that's why more and more accountants are choosing to rely on cost segregation firms who specialize in this area for support. To wrap this up, let's run through a brief case study to tie all these ideas together. Suppose we have this low-rise office building acquired in 1988 with various step-ups and basis through the years, giving us a total basis of $9.9 .9 today. Now, this is an actual case that I worked on, and I was the one who did the initial review of the depreciation schedule, and I found uh, $654,000 in historical cost to review as far as expensing possibilities under the tangible property regulations. Although this building had been owned for quite a while, I did recommend a cost segregation study for two reasons. One, to squeeze out all the possible remaining accelerated depreciation, and also to establish the unit's property breakdown for materiality testing of some of those assets I found in my initial review. So the cost segregation study yielded a 482,000 catch-up depreciation deduction, which at a 40% tax rate produced 192,000 in after-tax cash flow for the owner. Now, that was a fairly modest outcome. It was about 2% of the depreciable assets, but it wasn't the only reason that we did the study. So next, we went looking for TPR-related deductions. Here's a look at the unit of property summary in which the 9.9 .9 million initial cost basis was broken down by our engineers into the IRS-defined building systems. Now, this was done to assist in performing materiality testing both for prior years and also to help the client in future years in case they spent any more money on their property. Result, 
the TPR exercise produced $138,000 in tax savings, and that was the combined effect of three types of deductions. There were $70,000 in routine repair and maintenance deductions, uh, non-bar, non-material capital costs, two sixty-two, dollars and partial asset dispositions, $212,000. So once we identified and validated all the assets on the depreciation schedule that qualified for expensing treatment, the accountant was able to determine the amount of accumulated depreciation on each asset and then come up with the remaining tax basis of $346,000 to expense producing the write-off of $138,000 in tax savings. All right, that just about wraps it up. I want to thank you for your attention, but I want to make a couple of uh, important points in closing. First of all, the TPRs really represent some terrific new expensing opportunities for real estate owners. You can write off the remaining tax basis of many assets that no longer need to be depreciated under the new rules. And so that means you can expense some big ticket items such as uh, the new roof uh, in the examples that I gave. Now, one thing that's gone largely unnoticed is that with the TPRs, the IRS well, they basically issued regulations, not suggestions, and they apply to all investment property owners. They're not optional, even though many property owners out there and their tax advisors have treated them that way. The consequences to ignoring these regulations could be expensive, and here's why. It could be that the IRS could look at doing business as usual without adopting the regulations uh, as an improper accounting method, and that could result in the disallowance of your depreciation deductions that should have been expensed in the past. So it would therefore be a good idea to Heed the regulations by filing the appropriate forms if you haven't already done so, scrubbing the depreciation schedules, taking the permitted deductions, and following the new rules going forward. To sum it up, cost segregation is a great tool to crush your income taxes by identifying and supporting your rightful deductions for not only accelerated depreciation, but also routine maintenance, non-bar, non-material capital costs, and partial asset disposition. If you'd like to know more about how Bedford can help you crush your taxes, please get in touch with me. And, oh yeah, please visit my blog at CREtaxTalk.com and sign up to receive my newsletter to keep informed. All right, back to you, Karen. Thanks, Jeff. That's a lot of information, so to help everyone absorb it, we're sending out both a recording of the webinar and the slides to all of the attendees. This webcast would, will be repeated uh, in the future, so if you have some colleagues who might benefit from it, uh, you can email Jeff. We will now open it up to questions, and we'll be here as long as necessary to answer them. If you have to leave us, thanks for attending, and don't forget to check out Jeff's blog, CREtaxTalk.com. Okay, Karen, it looks like no questions, so we're going to finish up today. But again, thanks for attending, everybody, and have a great day.